Today's commemoration is part of the ongoing preparation by the Clanmult Ambush Commemoration Committee to mark the centenary of the ambush in 2021. We acknowledge the work and dedication of the committee in preparing for today and we offer our support and assistance in the ongoing preparations for 2021. I will now hand you over to the chairman of that committee, Mr. Christy O'Sullivan. Garmanagov. Loving fathers, families of the deceased, guest speaker and deputy mayor, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Clanmult Ambush Commemoration Committee, I would like to welcome you all here today to the 98th anniversary of the Clanmult Ambush. We are gathered to remember those brave volunteers who took part in the Clanmult Ambush. It was the greatest loss of life by the volunteers in a single action during the War of Independence. Our committee is drawn from the local community here in Clanmult, and we've come together to recall this sad event which took place here during the War of Independence. <coughs> I will now ask Tom O'Neill, author of the book, The Battle of Clanmold, to give a brief account of the ambush. I'll hand over now to Tom. Good afternoon to you all. The men that were involved in the ambush here on the 20th of February 1921 had been actively involved in attacks on Crown forces during 1920. And the very last occasion that they did so was on the main street in Middleton on the 29th of December 1920, when the column attacked members of a giant RIC Black and Tan Foot Patrol on the main street. The attack took place roughly between Wallace's, Finneen's, and Church Lane, on that side of the town. And during that attack, an RIC constable Martin Mullen and two black and tans were killed. And that had important consequences later. That's why he mentioned it. Following that attack, the column withdrew to its base at Kill Mountain. Early in the new year, then, they relocated, first of all, to Cotstown, Dungorny, and finally, on around the 6th of January, located to their new base camp here at Gary Lawrence Clanmold. I don't need to describe the finer details of the layout here because since last year there has been a fabulous model, a diorama of the location. So I'd invite you afterwards to look at that. But I would just point out the major, the major buildings. The, the actual dwelling house itself was behind the monument and in front of the bushes there and oriented east-west, so parallel with the hedge. And the cow shed then was roughly here at right angles heading in your direction. There are two other very important factors then. Number one, the roof of the dwelling house was touched and Crucially, critically, fatally, there was only one door in the house, and that was the front door, and you would have been facing the front door. So the, the front door was on the south side of the building. The column arrived here on around the 6th of January and set up their base. They were here for approximately 44, 45 days between then and the battle. And one of the reasons given was because it was a location for the collecting of funds, a sort of a tax that had been levied on farmers in the East Cork area. And it's important to remember, because of that attack on the end of December in Middleton, the Crown forces in Middleton and Cork were actively searching for that column. And they were using overt methods, they were using mobile patrols, foot patrols, bicycle patrols, but they were also using covert methods. They were using informers and the questioning of prisoners. And they were picking up information. On the week then prior to the battle, the column had been detailed to carry out an attack on a train travelling between Cove and Cork, 
and that attack was to happen on Tuesday the 22nd of February. And because of that mission then, the column commander had to do two things. Dermot Hurley had to carry out a reconnaissance of Cove Junction to make a plan for the attack. And the second decision was taken to relocate the column from here on Sunday evening, the 20th of February. On the Saturday evening then, the evening before the ambush, the evening before the battle, some of the column, five or six of them, went to concession in Dungourney. And when they were returning to here from Dungourney, they took the less obvious route, which is a standard safety precaution. They took the route from Dungourney, the high road via Rat Organ, up as far as Carey's house which is the first house about 300 metres north of Red Arden Crossroads on the right-hand side. It's still there. And from there, then, the members of the column took a track from the back of Carey's down to here. And without a doubt, from the events later, that's when they were spotted. The informer had them spotted on the route from Dungourney to Carey's. And we can show that from the actions of the British Army. On the Sunday morning then, John Hartley, Edmund Terry, both met after Mass in Churchtown South, and they were tasked to cycle here to the column to deliver fun cigarettes and clothing for the column. On their way then, in Ladies Bridge, they met two of their friends, Robert Walsh and William Gard, and they both cycled to Clanwell Village. And Edmund Terry had one other uh, purpose there, that was to visit his grandmother, Mrs. Fitzgerald. They arrived in Clanwell around half past two, and while the three lads were waiting for Edmund Terry to come out, Dick Hagerty arrived. Dick Hagerty was a member of the column that had been home on, in Gary Foe on weekends leave. And when Edmund Terry came out, the five of them walked to the, the location here, and all five arrived at the farmhouse from quarter to four. The column commander, as I mentioned earlier, he had a tasking to carry out a reconnaissance of Cove Junction. So he set off around mid-morning on the Sunday, and this is when things started to unravel because he took two of his senior officers with him. He took Vice Commandant Joe Hearn and Captain Paddy Whelan. So now you have three of the senior officers of the column, the three most senior officers of the column, going off in reconnaissance. And that isn't how it works. The, the column commander, yes, he goes on to reconnaissance, but he hands over command then temporarily to his second in command. However, in this instance, because he had taken the three senior, or the three senior officers went, they, they bypassed one other officer, and then temporary command of the column fell on Captain Jack O'Connor from Cove. So at that stage then, when they left, there were two sentries positioned up on the high ground off to the northwest, to your left. They were vital in all this because trouble was on the way. The informer that had spotted those chaps coming from coming from confession on the, on the Saturday evening had reported to Victoria Barracks in Cork, now Collins Barracks, and he gave them the location of where he thought the column was. And in an amazing twist, he was not leading them here. He was leading them to Carey's house. And the British Army reacted very quickly. They assembled a two-vehicle patrol of 27 soldiers. There were officers, NCOs and soldiers, a total force of 27. They had two Crosley tenders, and they set off from Victoria Barracks on quarter past two. Why 27? There was room for 28 in the trucks. The informer was brought along both as a guide and a hostage. The patrol was under the command of Lieutenant Hook of the 2nd Hampshire's, and they drove via Middleton RIC Barracks to Rat Arden Crossroads. They set up their patrol harbour there because they couldn't afford to come any closer. And they broke the patrol into three groups. Approximately one third stayed with the vehicles as a patrol harbour to protect the vehicles and to guard the, the, the actual informer. 
and to arrest any of the civilians that would come on the scene. The other two groups then were set off as two foot patrols, one on the Lieutenant Hook and the other on the Lieutenant Co. And they went on the western side of the road from Rathog Crossroads to Carey's and they carried out a cordman search of Carey's house because that's where they believed the column was. However, from their reports, they surrounded it and found it empty. Under normal circumstances, the officers would have said, right, we've done our duty, let's get back to barracks. But there was a bit of enthusiasm. They said, we have to be somewhere here. So they did what was called a map reconnaissance. They opened up the maps and they found the house here. So the two patrols then set off again. Lieutenant Hook, the patrol commander, the overall patrol commander, he came in from the northwest. That would be half left, would be the high ground up by the trees on the hill. He would have used the trees and come in behind the trees. Lieutenant Cole, the second patrol commander, he approached from the southwest. So he would have come over from that direction. And it was Lieutenant, Lieutenant Cole's patrol of 10 arrived here first. And by pure chance, Luke was out for the column because Coe's patrol approached from the southwest and even though they were only coming in from one side, by default they had the house surrounded because they had the front door covered. And there was no other way out of the house. There was only a small window at the back. You couldn't get out through that small window. When Coe's patrol approached, they found two volunteers, volunteer Michael Desmond and volunteer John Joe Joyce heading down in that direction to the well. You, you all passed the well on the way up uh, this afternoon. They were filling water bottles for the column because remember, the column was moving out. They were moving out in about three hours time. Now, you might say, well, how did the two patrols get here without being spotted? Because the two sentries had abandoned their position. The two sentries were actually in the house. So that's how Cole's patrol got here first without being spotted, and Hook's patrol came in to reinforce them within about five minutes. When the shooting started, the two volunteers, Michael Desmond and John Joe Joyce, were mortally wounded and died in the vicinity of the house. One of them died behind the house. When that happened then, Lieutenant Hook, who had been coming in from ear front left, decided that's it, the shooting has started, we can rush now. So he doubled the patrol forward. He would have been here within about five minutes. And that five minutes is a very good indicator because Captain Jack O'Connell, within that five minutes, came to the conclusion, we have to get out of the house. However, not everybody was in agreement with that. So Jack O'Connell led the breakout. He fitted a bayonet to his rifle and he was gone down in that direction. He went as far as the copse of trees, which you've seen in the, in the model, and he went in there first. And Lieutenant Cole and C.S. Connolly and another soldier were trying to manoeuvre around there when Jack O'Connell started firing at them and wounded C.S. Connolly in the shoulder. Lieutenant Hook Patrol at this stage had arrived just as the others had attempted to break out after Jack O'Connell. Remember, they came out the front door of the model there. So Michael Hallahan was first. He was shot dead at the door. Dick Hagerty got about halfway between you and me. He was mortally wounded because the soldiers were in the, on the ditch line behind you. James Ahern, the third man out, he ran off in a southwesterly direction. Unfortunately, he was running into further trouble. He was running in the direction of Red Harden Crossroads, and he was actually killed by one of the sentries up at Red Harden Crossroads. Dermot O'Leary then, the last member of the, to attempt to break out, he got out into the cowshed to realise no future here, so he made it back into the house on, under a, a hail of bullets. So Jack O'Connell had escaped, the British Army had 18 here at this stage, one wounded. Now the column was reduced because there were five dead. They started off with 16, that was now down to 11, plus the four young lads. We had a stalemate situation then because the column members couldn't get out 
and Hook didn't have enough soldiers to actually get in. So he sent two of the soldiers back to Rathorgan Crossroads to get one of the drivers to take to go to Middleton RIC barracks to, to get reinforcements. They'd have been expecting three or four RIC men. But again, Luke was out for the column because unfortunately for them, there were two truckloads of auxiliary police there. And the auxiliary police you did not want to meet. The auxiliaries arrived here around 20 past five and brought with them petrol and grenades. And Lieutenant Hammond then, the third officer, the fourth was Dove, Lieutenant Hammond, took the petrol, took the grenades, and he made his way around to the north or back of the house. Went up on the ditch, threw the jerry can of petrol up onto the, 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 the thatch, set fire to the thatch, and followed it with some of the grenades. And within 15 or 20 minutes, the members of the, the column inside had only a choice of either burn to death inside or be fumigated. They were just overcome with the fumes, so they had to surrender. A column member was the first out, and the four young lads were next. Then seven more of the columns. So a total of 12 left the house then to surrender. And John Harty was struck down by the arrival from one of the auxiliaries, and the remainder then were directed over to the cowshed, over on your left. And the auxiliaries opened fire on them. One of the British Army officers then regained control, but it was too late, because by then the auxiliaries had, had killed seven of the surrendered volunteers. Donald Dennehy, Christopher O'Sullivan, Jeremiah Hearn, his first cousin Liam, David Desmond, whose brother had been killed earlier, jo Joseph Morrissey and James Gavin were dead. So now, 12 of the volunteers were dead. Sonia Lurie had been wounded earlier and Morris Moore and Pat O'Sullivan had delayed coming out with him, so that's what saved them from being killed by the auxiliaries. The auxiliaries now had eight prisoners. They had Morris Moore, Pat O'Sullivan and Robert Walsh, and they had five wounded. Dermot O'Leary wounded in the head. Paddy Higgins shot in the face by one of the auxiliaries. John Harty clubbed in the side of the head, and Edmund Terry and William Gard had received arm and abdominal wounds from the auxiliaries. The prisoners were searched, taken on trucks to Middleton RIC barracks, and from there back to Victoria barracks. The bodies were left here overnight, and one of the ladies that arrived here that evening was a Miss Allen a grand aunt of Alan Dukes. The British Army returned the following morning and removed the 12 bodies to Victoria Barracks where they called, carried out a military court of inquiry. The bodies were returned to the families on Wednesday night. The bodies in the Republican plot in Middleton were buried on Thursday morning and the two men from Cove were buried on Thursday afternoon. Dick Hagerty was buried, was buried in Ballamacoda on Friday morning. Seven then of the eight prisoners were tried by military court during March and three of them, uh, all seven were found guilty and three of them were sentenced to death. Morris Moore, Pat O'Sullivan, were, they were both executed in the Cork military detention barracks, the old Cork jail, on Thursday the 28th of April because at that stage Sonny O'Leary's sentence of death had been commuted to penal servitude for life, and the four young lads had been sentenced to penal servitude for life. Paddy Higgins, the eighth prisoner, he couldn't be tried with the others because of his mouth wound. He was later tried by military court, sentenced to death, and his appeal dragged on, and he was saved, saved by the truth. Dermot Hurley, the column commander, was killed north of Middleton, on the 28th of May. And to conclude, the men of the column were indeed very brave men and were well aware of the risk they faced. They faced overwhelming odds and knew if they were captured that they still faced the possibility of execution. An amazing statistic is that of the members of the column that were here on the 20th of February 
1921, 75% of them were dead by the end of May or by the truth. So it's so important that we continue to remember all of these men, their bravery, sacrifices they made, and let's work together to ensure that their names shall never be forgotten. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. I am very privileged to introduce to you our next guest speaker here today, Mr. Alan Jokes. In his address, he will also explain his family connection with the area and this site. Thank you. Alan, thank you. I'm greatly honored to have been asked to make an oration on this occasion. It's an occasion for a mixture of emotions. Sadness at the deaths that we commemorate, sympathy with those who are left bereaved, family and neighbours, and on the other hand, great gratitude and honour to those who gave their lives uh, to bring about our freedom. As we commemorate the Clonmouth ambush and many other fatal engagements during the course of the War of Independence, we would do well, I think, to reflect on the results of failures of politics and failures of political understanding, many of which continue to affect us to this day in relations between our country and the UK. The War of Independence that started in January of 1919 was the latest in a centuries-long series of actions aimed at ending British political and economic domination in Ireland. It's probably inevitable that in the light of the history of relations between those two countries, armed conflict would eventuate, despite the enormous disparity between the opposing forces. To put it simply, the Irish would never be reconciled to subjection. The British could never understand why any part of the Union or of the Empire would wish to leave. An ironic enough thought in the day that's in it. The persistence of the numerically and logistically inferior Irish forces and their guerrilla tactics proved to be highly problematic for the British forces. The insurgents clearly had the benefit of deep sympathy and support among the population. The British political establishment finally had enough of an intractable problem on its doorstep and negotiated a conclusion which everybody involved knew to be incomplete but which was the least bad available. The Irish achievement was remarkable in the circumstances. We owe our independence and our freedom to decide Ireland's course in the world to those who took up arms to achieve it. As a former politician, I have to admit that I feel uneasy and uncomfortable in discussing armed conflict and in seeming, however reluctantly, to justify it. Ideally, it should be a very last resort. War is always and everywhere a horrible and terrible thing. And God knows we have enough reasons, even in our time today, to realise, to understand the dreadfulness of war that we see in so many places around us, in Yemen, in the Middle East, in parts of Africa. It is to be avoided whenever we can. And if it happens, it is always because of a lack of political understanding, political imagination, 
on political commitment. But as I've said, I believe that armed conflict between Ireland and England was always inevitable at some point. And the reason, I believe, is to be found in a failure of British political understanding over years, and more particularly after the Act of Union in 1800. The Clonmel's ambush was one of many such episodes during the course of the War of Independence, and inevitably some of them turned out badly uh, for the IRA. Uh, you've heard the history of what happened here today. It is probably fair to say that all of those involved in the action of that day recognised the serious risks inherent in their actions. Each was doing what he considered to be his duty as laid down by those whose authority he accepted, whether as a volunteer or as an agent. At the end of it, some 20 families at least were left to mourn their dead. In later times, other families were left to live with bitterness and suspicion, whether it was merited or not, among neighbours and relations. I've only recently learned through the good offices of Tim O'Sullivan of my family connection. On the day after the fatal, on the evening of the fatal event indeed, some local people went to the ambush site to clean the bodies, to lay them out in a respectful, decent, humane and neighbourly action. There were two Mrs Mulcahy and a Miss Lena Allen. And Lena was my father's aunt, my grandmother's sister. She lived at Ballydunna Moor. Uh, she taught at Dungourney School. Uh, she actually lived in a site that I saw for the first time ever this morning at the gateway of Dungourney GAA Club. The house is gone, uh, but the memory is still there. Lena later married Pat Motherway, who farmed at Mona Shask. Uh, and when they retired, they went to live uh, in Cove. Now, I have to say, as a young child, I never heard any reference in the family to those events. And it was probably because of those times, and many of you will remember what I mean when I say this, children were to be seen and not heard. But learning of that family connection set me to thinking about the connections that we Irish have with the British, about the conflicts that we've had, and how those connections and conflicts have evolved and shaped our relationship over this past century. Lena Allen's brother-in-law, my grandfather, was English. He had served in the British Army. He laid telephone wires in the trenches in Gallipoli. Happily, he survived. He came back to Ireland. He had previously converted to Catholicism in order to be allowed to marry my grandmother. I remember him with great affection as an upright, rather austere man with a very dry sense of humour. He spent his working life after the Great War as a telephone line engineer, travelling the roads of North Kerry with a motorbike and sidecar and uh, a workmate in all weathers. And his colleagues always spoke of him with great affection and respect. When he retired, he um, and my grandmother went to live with Lena and their other sister Lizzie uh, in Cove. But there was a humane, decent act in support of Irish rebels carried out by a woman whose brother-in-law had been a British soldier. My mother's father, whom I never knew because he died very young, was at that time a constable in the Dublin Metropolitan Police and became a member of the Garda Síochána when that force was set up. Some members of his wife's family worked on the railways during that period, and they smuggled guns in the water tanks of their engines for the volunteers. My mother-in-law remembers stories in her family, they lived in Cork Street in Dublin, of weapons being hidden up in the chimney of their house for the volunteers, and they lived in trepidation of a black and tan raid, but the guns were never found in the house. But I've no doubt that there are similar threads of conflicting associations 
that are overcome by human affections and family histories all over this country. They're among the many powerful influences that have helped to shape the development of Anglo-Irish relations over the course of the century since the fatal events that we commemorate today. We will remember even more such conflicting associations when we come to consider the commemoration of the events of the civil war that followed that war of independence. We are a people who have a very wide range of conflicts and connections between ourselves. And I think it is greatly to our credit that we have, over time, learned to accommodate, to live with, to appreciate those conflicts, to overcome the conflicts, and allow our human emotions and concerns to override the differences. As I've already said, the War of Independence was then the latest in a centuries-long series of actions aimed at ending British political and economic domination. And it goes back. Before the arrival of the Vikings, England and Ireland were not that terribly different. Indeed, Wales and Scotland, similarly. Each was a collection of separate, usually warring kingdoms and fiefdoms, often with competition between pretenders to take the preeminent leadership. The Vikings arrived to raid and plunder. They eventually founded kingdoms of their own in parts of Ireland and parts of England. They were never conclusively defeated. They were never ejected from either country, but gradually became accepted elements and integrated into the social and economic systems. The Normans, in turn, were descendants of those Vikings who settled in the northwest of France. They began their conquest of England in 1066. Their conquest of Ireland began, as we know, in 1169, at the invitation of an ambitious but weak Irish king. Over time, in England, the Normans and the British assimilated and merged. The Normans, the Angles, the Britons, and their mingled descendants succeeded, by and large, in uniting England under a strong monarchy. By the time of the Tudors, they had absorbed the Welsh into their social and economic system. After the upheaval of the Reformation, Britain subdued Scotland and forced a union at the beginning of the 17th century to form Great Britain. The Normans in Ireland and their descendants assimilated with the Irish. They gradually developed their own interests separate from those of their neighbours in England. They became, as the history books tell us, Nis Gaeli on the Gael fame. They did not, however, succeed in establishing any form of unified rule, and they refused to accept the doctrines of the Reformation. The English monarch was able to dominate this fractured and fractious uh, group of Irish powers. The English monarchy was always strong enough to be able to overcome any opposition, but never succeeded in eradicating the desire for separation. Despite plantations, religious persecution, the Act of Union of 1800, and industrial discrimination in favour of the North East, Ireland was never subdued. Separatism and pro-independent agitation were constant undercurrents in relations in London's dealings with Ireland. The strength and the cultural origins of those undercurrents were never fully understood in London. It took a massive civil campaign led by Daniel O'Connell to secure Catholic emancipation. It took a massive, enduring and controversial campaign by the Land League and the support of Parnell's party to secure agrarian reform in the form of the Land Acts of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and the constitution of the Congested District Board. The British political system had great difficulty in coming to accept the argument for home rule in Ireland, and even that acceptance was qualified and grudging. 
London proved incapable of understanding the warning that was given by the Easter Rising of 1916 and reacted in a way which fanned the flames of rebellion. The British difficulty in understanding the Irish from the time of Oliver Cromwell on can, I suppose, be explained, at least in part, by the fact that Britain was much occupied with the acquisition or the conquest of territories and the expansion of trade with Asia, Africa and the Americas and a succession of wars with France, Spain and others. The Industrial Revolution gave rise to far-reaching social, economic and political changes. The British government's concern in dealing with those changes was concentrated mainly on the population in Great Britain and to a much lesser extent in the dominions, in the colonies and in the empire. The dominions, the colonies and the empire were the source of raw materials for British industry, markets for British exports and occasionally were places where competition with British industry had to be suppressed. The failure of the British political system to understand the strength and inspiration of the independence movement was not peculiar to Anglo-Irish relations. It gave rise to problems elsewhere in the world. The colonists in America were stirred to revolution by a British government which they regarded as rapacious and oppressive. India endured a period of political turbulence and violence before independence was achieved. The British solution for Pakistan proved to be toxic for the people of the region, eventually resulting in the formation of Bangladesh from East Pakistan, and conflict which continues to this day. Only last week there was another eruption of conflict on those borders. British forces fought a bloody war with the Mau Mau in Kenya and with insurgents in Malaya. Ian Smith's Universal Declaration of Independence in Rhodesia cut the ties with Britain but did not resolve that country's fundamental problems. So as I said, the British failure to understand was not peculiarly directed at us Irish, but by God, they failed to understand us. The War of Independence was brought to an end in December of 1921 by the treaty between the British government and the provisional government set up by the first Zion Aaron in 1919. It's ironic that that war was ended after a process of jaw-jaw following a period of war-war. Winston Churchill never realised the irony of that aphorism that he gave to the world. It is significant that the first soil in 1919, in one of its first acts, sought international recognition, even though that request was unsuccessful. But that showed a clear understanding of the need for Ireland to insert itself into an international framework that was not dominated by Britain, an understanding that was followed up later on by Ireland's accession to the League of Nations. It was a clear recognition of the fact that as a small nation living close to a much larger one, we needed a framework of external support and authority to assist us in dealing with the challenges of the real politic of living beside a bigger neighbour. That same understanding conditioned Ireland's support for successful enlargements of the European Union for countries that had newly liberated themselves from the Soviet influence. It's remarkable that the Irish state that emerged from the War of Independence is one of the very few states to emerge in the aftermath of the Great War to survive continuously and unchanged through the intervening century. States that emerged after the Great War in the Baltic region and in Central Europe became battlefields during the Second World War, 
they enjoyed a period of independence and then were again subjugated by external powers. And they regained their freedom only after the Soviet sphere of influence was reduced uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think it's a matter of some pride for us that Ireland was an early and enthusiastic supporter of the accession of those countries uh, to the European Union for the very same reasons that the first Nile realised that we needed to make our place secure in the world by having that kind of external recognition. Following the foundation of the Irish Free State, relations with the UK were very strained. The economic war of the 1930s was perhaps emotionally understandable, but was a serious negative influence on Irish economic development and on relations with the UK. It was reversed before the beginning of the Second World War. After that war, there was a more constructive approach to trade relations, paving the way for two successive Anglo-Irish free trade area agreements, one in the late 1940s and one in the early 1960s. While these agreements were clearly preferable to the economic war mentality, they were heavily weighted in favour of the UK side, the side of the larger and more powerful partner. Accession to the European Economic Community in 1973 brought about the most significant and the most fruitful improvement in Anglo-Irish relations. From Ireland's point of view, the key feature was that the relationship became a relationship of equals, as fellow members of a community of rules and laws. Where the two countries had significant differences, and there were many differences, particularly on agricultural policy and on monetary policy, these differences were worked out within an accepted framework of rules, laws, and negotiation structures. This framework and the habits of accommodation which it fostered contributed massively to the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. It seems to me that we now, we may now have come full circle. Britain's colonies are gone, the empire is no more. Some English voices now speak of a desire to build a new global Britain outside the European Union, based on the ability to move away from commonly agreed EU rules and standards and on the freedom to negotiate new trade relations with countries outside Europe. This is reminiscent of the Britons of the 17th and 18th centuries, setting out boldly in a world where trade followed the flag, and there were few competitors with the same capacity um, for global reach and influence. But to date, only six of the, 40, the more than 40 countries with which the European Union has a trade agreement or investment agreements have come to outline agreements on their future relations uh, with the UK. No new trading arrangements have yet appeared on the horizon, even with Australia and New Zealand. The Irish, with their inconvenient northeast, their backstop, and their support for a framework of international relations not dominated by Britain are again a problem, and even the Scots are getting restive again. Brexit, whatever form it takes, will inevitably damage not just the structures of cooperation that have evolved between our two countries, but the underlying body of shared political understanding built up over 45 years of deep cooperation in the European context. There are some in this country who say that we should follow Britain, the UK, out of the EU. They should look back at the history of Anglo-Irish relations in the centuries before 1973. They should ask themselves if there is any evidence that the British political establishment shows any greater understanding of Irish concerns and ambitions today than it did in the past. 
they should question whether our experience of two First World War II trade agreements with the UK compare favourably with our experience of the EU Customs Union and Siegel Market. And they should ask themselves why it, it took years of bloody conflict to bring the British political establishment to the realisation that it was untenable to treat a part of the population of one corner of the UK in a manner that would have been considered utterly unacceptable in the rest of that country. And they should ask themselves whether a hard Brexit and a victory for the ERG would produce a more congenial environment for Ireland in today's world. Ladies and gentlemen, the rain has beaten me to the conclusion, but I would like to make it clear that I do not for a moment accuse the current UK government of any evil intent towards Ireland or any other state in the EU, but at the same time, I believe that it's abundantly clear that a Brexit campaign, inward-looking, takes no account of its effects elsewhere. We would be foolish to believe that Irish concerns would figure largely in the actions of future British governments unless future Irish governments act with determination. Brexit will be a key factor in the future of Anglo-Irish relations. The process so far contains a crucial message for us. The current parliamentary fiasco in Westminster demonstrates beyond a doubt that it is utterly unwise to propose a major change in any country's relations with its neighbours without having worked out the consequences of achieving success in that, in that endeavour. And that means that for us, we should not for a moment think of promoting a border poll without having a very clear and coherent plan about how we deal with the consequences of success. Donald Tusk spoke of the special place in hell for the people who undertook Brexit without even the sketch of a plan. And I think the same sentiments would apply if we undertook a border poll without a very clear plan and understanding for what would follow a successful running of such a poll. Those who fought successfully for freedom in the war of independence here in Clonmult and elsewhere did not suffer so that we could again accept the status of a client state vis-a-vis -vis the UK, nor did they fight so that we would fail again to bring about a successful and harmonious all-Ireland political unity. I would like to thank Mr. Alan Jokes for the most inspiring talk and today again thank him for making our event here today so special. I would also like to thank the Deputy Lord Mayor, the Deputy County Mayor, Mary Lennon Foley, for being with us here today. Uh, we will now have the cross lane ceremony. During the War of Independence, captured volunteers were interned in Ballykindler Barracks, County Down. Ballykindler was a mass internment camp and could house up to 2,000 prisoners. Inmates often endured a harsh regime, and making wooden crosses in memory of fallen comrades became a hobby of the prisoners. A wooden cross bearing the names of those who died here at Tonmult Ambush and the prisoners who were later executed was made by Tom McMillan from Kinsale during his inter internment in Ballykenler Camp in July 1921. This cross is in the possession of the committee and is on display here in front of the monument. 24 replica crosses, replica crosses have been made in memory of all those who were present in the house here in Gary Lawrence on February 20, 1921. These will now be presented and placed in the beautifully constructed display by the monument. Remembering Commandant Dermot Hurley, whose cross is presented by Anthony Weiss, a grandnephew. Remembering Vice 
Vice Commandant Joe Ahern, whose cross is presented by Joe Ahern, his son. Remembering Captain Paddy Whelan, whose cross is presented by Conor Nelligan, the Heritage Officer with Cork County Council. Remembering Captain Dermot O'Leary, whose cross is presented by George Fogarty from Killa Historical Society. Remembering Captain Paddy Higgins, whose cross is presented by Liam Hagerty. Remembering Captain Jack O'Connell, whose cross is presented by David O'Connell, a grandson. Remembering Captain Richard Hagerty, whose cross is presented by Anne Keneally, his niece. Remembering Captain James Ahern, whose cross is presented by Brian Ahern, his nephew. Remembering Lieutenant Patrick O'Sullivan, whose cross is presented by Betty Holland. Remembering Lieutenant Christopher O'Sullivan, whose cross is presented by Mary Brown. Volunteer Jeremiah Hearn, whose cross is presented by Bertha Hearn, a grandnephew. Remembering volunteer Joseph Morrissey, whose cross is presented by Clive Owens, a great grandnephew. Remembering volunteer Michael Hallahan whose cross is presented by Tony Hallahan, a grandnephew. Remembering volunteer James Glavin, whose cross is presented by Dermot Higgins. Remembering volunteer John George Ice, whose cross is presented by Dennis Stack, a relative. Remembering volunteer Michael Desmond, whose cross is presented by David Desmond, his nephew. Remembering volunteer Donald Dennehy, whose cross is presented by Donald Dennehy, his grandnephew. Remembering volunteer Lee Mahern, whose cross is presented by Caroline Murphy, his grandniece. Remembering volunteer David Desmond, whose cross is presented by Jim O'Callaghan. Remembering volunteer Morris Moore, whose cross is presented by Sinead O'Sullivan. Remembering John Harty, whose cross is presented by John Harty, his son. Remembering Edmund Terry, whose cross is presented by Mary Terry, his niece. Remembering William Gard, whose cross is presented by Eileen Fitzgerald, his daughter.
Robert Walsh, whose cross is presented by Holly Walsh, his grandnephew. I will now call on the piper to play the lament. Father Barry O'Flynn will now lead us in a prayer ceremony for all those who lost their lives here in Clanmold and for all those who died during the War of Independence. <coughs> in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. The grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God the Almighty Father raised his Son Jesus Christ from the dead. With confidence we ask him to save all his people, living and dead. For our relatives and friends who have gone before us and await the kingdom, that they may have the reward of their goodness. Lord, hear us. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face. Lord, hear us. For those whose fate was known to you alone, that they will have light, happiness, and peace. Lord, hear us. For all who mourn for the loss of their loved ones, that they will find comfort in their sadness, certainty in their doubt, and courage in their loneliness. Lord, hear us. We, for ourselves who have assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be reunited one day with, with all whom we love, when every tear will be wiped away. Lord, hear us. Let us now bring all our prayers before the Father as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not in temptation but deliver us from evil. Lord God, whose days are without end, 
and whose mercy is beyond counting. Keep, keep us mindful that life is short and the, day, uh, the hour of death unknown. Let your spirit guide our days on earth in the ways of holiness and justice that we may serve you in union with the whole church, sure in faith, strong in hope, and perfect in love. And when our earthly journey is ended, lead us rejoicing into your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. May a perpetual light shine upon them and may they rest in peace. Amen. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Finally, Mila Bukas to everybody who took part in today's commemoration. A special thanks to those who travelled long, long distances, those who came from overseas to be with us today. Our guest speaker, Mr. Alan Jokes, our MC, James Lee here, all those who helped in the cross lane ceremony, Farrah Flynn, who led the prayer service here, Canon John Terry, Father Eddie Griffin, Father Barry, who can celebrated Mass earlier, our four choir for their beautiful renditions, the Piper, Christy McCarthy, the Bugler, Roy Kelleher. Thanks to all who helped in any way, not just here today, but since our committee was set up. Thanks also to Dave Coyley the, for the the diameter of the battle site, as you can see down here, and it's well worth taking a look at before you go. We will now have the last post, and this will be followed by the raising of the flag and reveille. Thank you.